uh, 2 verse 6. Judges chapter 2 from verse 6. We're going to look at it just now. All right, so we're in this um, series called His Story. And we just had a bit of a break for Easter. I hope you had a good Easter uh, time. And uh, just basically before Easter, what happened is we basically camped out by Jericho. And we were talking about what kind of people does God use to advance his kingdom. Remember way back we spoke about what kind of a person God uses to partner with. And we said a person that trusts in his story. And, and before Easter we spoke what kind of people uh, God uses. And we said people that, um, that, that will basically trust in the story and take ground and advance his kingdom. And we spoke about Joshua. And, and we said, well, why, why is it significant that God use Joshua? You remember? Well, obviously, it was such a life altering message that you guys are so it's ingrained in your mind. Hey? Well, because he was scared. Hey? He was scared to death. And God uses people that are scared to death. He doesn't want to use people that got it all figured out together. And we also spoke about Rahab and we said Rahab was a prostitute and why was she significant to God? Well, because morally she did not figure it out at all. She didn't uh, know what to do and she got herself involved in that life that she was involved. But God used her. And so much so that God used her that she was even mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And I love that God uses guys and, and, and ladies who don't have it all together. Okay? I can identify with that because I don't have it all figured out. So today we, what we're going to do is talk about the, the section of history that is covered in the book of Judges. Okay? And most of the time when you read the Old Testament, you sort of get to the Judges and you look and you go, ooh, what's this all about? And you just skip all those pages and before you know it, you're in the New Testament already. So I want to kind of set the stage for you a little bit so to maybe make you understand Judges a bit better. When the Israelites moved into the Promised Land, okay, each tribe is given a portion and is divided by landmarks and different things and each of those 12 tribes are given that portion of that land what happened is that they are responsible for going in and taking over that portion that was now allocated to them having saying that today we are going to try and wrestle with few questions as they take in an advanced kingdom and the questions that I want us to wrestle with this morning is, how do we make sure that we transfer our love of God to our children? Okay? How do we make sure that we can transfer our love of God to our children? The second thing I want us to, to wrestle with a little bit is, do we believe that God is holding out on us, or has God given us everything that we need? Okay? That's the second thing I want us to wrestle with. And the final thing is, can you serve God when you're not in crisis? Okay? Can you serve God when you're not in crisis? And these are some, some of the main themes of the book of Judges. So we're going to wrestle with that a bit this morning. And we're going to start with Judges chapter 2, verse 6 to 19. And it says that uh, after Joshua... They dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, and he had seen all the great things that the Lord has done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnah Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gashan. Now I want you to listen to this. After that whole generation had been gathered to the ancestor, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. 
Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served Baal. Now let's pause there. And you say, well, you think to yourself, how does this happen? How does that happen? How is it that one generation after the desert experience, how is it that like the children that they had, okay, this is the generation we're talking about, these are the children that those people who were in the desert, they raised up, they grew up, they didn't know anything about God or what God has done. How is that possible? And it raises for us who are parents and grandparents who are going to be parents one day, how do I ensure that my children know who my God is? And that they know what this God has done in my life? How do I make sure of that? Because I think what happens to us a lot of times is that it's not so much that we want to withhold information from our children, but more that we don't factor in the time to do it. So here's what I'm, I'm going to suggest to you. And, and hey, I'm not an expert in parenting. As a matter of fact, the more I'm a parent, the less I know about parenting. But here's the thing. Whenever you hold something that you don't work hard on or hard at, your kids will hold it as insignificant. Okay? Does that make sense? Here's what it means if your relationship with the Lord and your obligation within the faith community, you hold it as something not worthwhile or not really working on it. Like, yes, it's important, but I have no time. I need to do these things and other things, and maybe we shouldn't do that. And you give a whole lot of other excuses. Your children will believe that the thing is insignificant. Because if you can easily replace it with something else, it's insignificant. So if you want your children to love the Lord, if you want them to be involved in a faith community that will help them to grow, help them to be everything that they're meant to be, then you hold that thing as precious and dear. And your children need to see you holding it as dear. Okay? In other words, your children need to see you reading the Word of God. Not just know that you are reading the Word of God, but they need to see you do it. And the thing that we are busy with at the moment is a good way of doing it. They need to see that you're doing it. Now, how is it possible that a whole generation did not know about anything that God has done? Now, I understand they were busy taking over a country. I understand that. But that's important. So how do I pass on the God that I know? You see, they didn't do that. And it caused a problem. And we see the cycle that happens in the book of Judges because of it. The cycle goes like this. They, they start worshipping other gods and then bad things start happening. Okay? To which they will say, well, God is punishing them. But I don't think it's so much that God is punishing them in the sense of sort of like what we think of cause and effect. I think that we see is that God told these people that you will be the ones who will tell the world who I am. And when they're not doing what they were supposed to do and they give the world an, 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 an not an accurate picture of who God is, then of course he intervenes, doesn't he? Of course he has to bring them back because, I mean, they are responsible to tell the world who, who he is. And they're not doing it. And God intervenes. Does that make sense? It is more that God is bringing them back to the point that they can turn to Him. And actually they do. They cry out to God. And they cry out to God and say, send us a judge. Now, now you need to understand that the judge in the period of the Bible, they didn't function like a king. Okay? 
they were typically uh, they were uh, in every tribe and they were basically uh, in charge of the sphere of influence okay now in our world view the judge is the one who pronounces the judgment isn't it okay they give out the, the sentence but in the world of the old testament the judge is the one responsible for carrying out the judgment god is the one who pronounces the judgment okay but they have to carry it out and that's why for example you have gideon leading the army into battle because he's acting out the sentence okay you have samson who's beating up people okay you have Ehud, who comes into the king and he gets his sword past the guards and he goes to the king and he draws his sword and he puts the sword in the guy's gut and he literally the bible says he loses the sword inside his gut and he can't even pull it out cool <laughs> i mean if you're a kind of guy who likes you know fast cars movies and and this kind of sword fighting i mean that's i mean he he loses his sword in his gut that's gruesome but but that's hey that's in the bible okay i mean these are people who are trying to call the people to god and who god is and so we see this cycle and they do really sort of get these judges to 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 pronounce not only to pronounce but do the judgment itself the sentence but as soon as the judges dies okay they're like well we don't we don't want to to, we don't know what to do anymore we, we we need someone else and then there's another judge and the same thing happens over and over and everything falls apart and then they cry out to god and then another judge comes and so on and and i want you to see how many judges they literally had can you put up the slide of the judges yeah there you go so there's a list of judges in there and you can see some of them basically just get few verses like Nathaniel only gets few verses here okay but uh, Gideon gets few chapters can you see over here and Samson Samson gets also few chapters in here so so these are some of the judges and each judge was doing what God asked him to do and they basically they didn't pronounce the sentence but they acted out the sentence and it's interesting to me that these stories like Gideon and Samson we know the story and if you've been to church long enough you you will know who Gideon is okay you know who Gideon is he's a guy with a fleece okay which by the way God doesn't really like the fleece we tend to think I'm just going to put a fleece before God and if you read that story God really didn't like that but Samson is the one that gets the most chapters if you look at this I mean Samson gets chapters 13 to 16 and um, and it's all about him so we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to camp out not so much on Samson himself but on the tribe that he was sent to be judge over okay and he was sent to be a judge over the tribe of Dan. I'm going to ask you to put the next slide on. Okay. And, and he was asked to be in the tribe of Dan. Okay. And he has basically all your tribe. Um, and there's the tribe of ba Dan. Okay. There's Ephraim and, and then Judah over here. Manasseh over here. Ooh, my thing is losing its power. But there's Manasseh. Um, so you can see Dan is right here and it's, it's not a big one is it it's quite small almost like insignificant but but that's Dan now when Israel moves into the promised land these are the boundaries in this map these are the boundaries that God gives Joshua to assign to the people okay and um, Dan is a small tribe okay now i don't know if you remember your old testament or not but do you remember why the malachites attacked the israelite in rephidim okay in exodus 16 all the way to 19 chapter 16 all the way 19 it tells you the story of of what they did and how they did it 
Now, why did they attack the Israelite from the back? Because if you read the story, you'll see that they attacked them from the back. Because typically, when you move in one body of people, who are the ones who are normally at the back? The feeble, the weak, the, the sick. Uh, you know, the people who couldn't keep up, were, they tend to be left behind. So God sends the Amalekites to attack from the back because what it does, it forces the community to protect and put them in the center, which is where, he's got, where, where God's community is. And if you look at there, um, Dan, if you look at Dan, you get the two big tribes, Manasseh and Judah, basically surrounding um, Dan. Okay? And, and that is God community. That's what God does. He puts people that will surround you and help you. And after that event, the tribe of Dan is given um, responsibility of being the last tribe in the line in a procession. Okay? And as they move through the desert, Dan always brings up the rear. Okay? So they are charged with making sure that the weak and that the sick and those who are slow don't fall behind. Okay? So that is the responsibility of Dan after Exodus chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19. That's what, what happens with Dan. Now Judah, I mean you can see Judah is quite a big tribe. Okay? Now, they lead the procession. In other words, they are the first tribe. So you can see that this is causes a bit of a complex for Dan. Okay? I mean, yeah, why are we always at the back? Why, why is Judah in the front? Okay? Why do we always have to be in the back? So it sort of like has a bit of a complex. Now, in order to understand this map and the strategic location of the tribes, I want you to think of this as a big, listen to this, as a big bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich. Which, if you think about it, is a little bit funny, talking about Israel in terms of bacon. I mean, you must get this, eh? Okay? <laughs> okay. Now, what am I talking about? And it actually works, okay? When I used to lecture at Varsity, I used to teach my, my students um, this very terminology because when you think about it as, 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 as that kind of a sandwich, then you actually see what, what, what I mean, okay? Now, I want you to put it on the next slide if you can. Okay. So, basically, at the top here, Okay, where it says the Sea of Galilee. Can you see? Okay, my thing is not working that well. Can you see where it says the Sea of Galilee? Yes, okay. That's the bun. That's the top of the bun. Okay? And then you've basically got five strips. That's the bacon. Okay? Five strips of sort of regions that are going from the top to the bottom. Okay? And um, the one in the middle, the one which shows a sort of like light in color is called the Shvela. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Now, basically, they run vertically. If you look at this map, you get the coastal plain on the side. There's a the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. And Dan goes into the coastal plain. If you remember the map that I showed you just now, Dan is somewhere over here. Okay. And they go into the sea. So that's your first. Your first thing is the coastal plain. That's your first strip of bacon. Okay. The next plane is what is called the Shefala. Can you say Shefala? Okay. And Shefala is basically the lowlands. Okay. Then you, you get the Judean mountains. Okay. Those are the Judean mountains. These are the mountains of Judah. Okay. So this is places like Masada. If you heard of Masada, uh, Jerusalem is on one of the Judean mountains. Jerusalem is high up on, 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 on a mountain. Okay? And then you get the Judean wilderness. Okay? And remember we spoke about the Judean wilderness. That is that pictures that I showed you of the path of righteousness a few weeks back. And we spoke about that, that river okay, that you couldn't see any water because it's, it, there was no water. Okay? That's, a, that's the Judean wilderness. And, and, we're, and, and the last thing that we get, the last strip, okay, is the Rift Valley. Okay, so it starts from Sea of Galilee. Uh, actually, it starts from the mountains up here on the top, the Sea of Galilee, and then into the Dead Sea, and eventually it stops at the Dead Sea. But that Rift Valley actually carries on all the way uh, in between um, uh, the two continents. 
Okay? So those strips are important. Now the way of the kings, okay, there were two major highways in that time, and, 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 and you will see why I'm telling you all this geographical, his, uh, historical thing, because it, it will all come together. Okay, so stay with me. There were two major highways. You see where on top of the Sea of Galilee over there, okay, that was the way, it was called the Way of the Kings, okay, and then basically down the coast here, literally uh, right on the coast, that was called the Via Maris which means the way of the sea okay now if you wanted to come from this part of the world and you wanted to go into egypt because egypt had a lot of gold egypt had metal egypt had money there was a lot of stuff in egypt okay you will have to cross over from the way of the kings into the way of the sea that was the route that was at least the safest route okay and um that is the way that people would go. The way of the sea was the only way that connected the way to Egypt. Okay? And, and, and interestingly enough, a lot of the people in history were not really interested in Israel. Israel was really a crossroad okay, to Egypt. That's what they were interested in, is in Egypt. Every conquering army wanted to get to, to Egypt. Okay? So, um, the coastal plain became the main strategic place of the whole region. Can you see why? Okay, so what kind of people, having known that now, what kind of people do you imagine were going to live in that area? Hey? I mean, this is high in trade, okay? These spices from the east, these gold from Egypt, okay? And by the way, if you came from modern day uh, uh, Europe up here, you would also have to go down here. So you would get a lot of cosmopolitan kind of people, isn't it? Okay, and each of those people will bring their gods. Okay, so there was a lot of pagans who lived there with their own gods and with their own culture and, and all that kind of stuff. In the Judea mountain is, a, is mostly where all the Israelites basically lived. Not all of them lived up here in the Judean mountain, but the majority. And certainly Jerusalem was, was there. Okay? And in the area of the Shephelah. Okay? There is the Shephelah, the one with the white. Okay? That being said, there was a saying that literally developed during that time that people will ask each other, how is your Shephelah? In other words, where, where, where do you engage people with regards to God? This pagan people. Okay, how is your shvila? How is it going with the way that you are engaging with the people? In other words, how are you doing in engaging with people who don't know God? Now, so many stories happen in a shvila. Okay, David and Goliath. The story of David and Goliath happened in the region, region of the Shephelah. Okay? The so story of Samson happens in the Shephelah. And I want to show you one, I want to show you some pictures. Why don't you put on the next picture? Okay? This is a part of the Shephelah. Okay? Um, in the last uh, tour, we stopped and, and some people took pictures. And this is basically two places up on the hill there. Um, you can't see it, but up on the hill, and the two little humps, that one and that one, behind it, these two cities, it's called the Shora and Ashkelon, and those cities are named in the Bible, because it, it speaks about that the Spirit of the Lord moved on Samson between these two cities, okay? Now, when Samson is born, all of the tribe of Dan are living on that ridge, Okay? All of the tribe of Dan are living on that ridge line. Now, what's the problem with that? It's not where they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be at the coast. Can you see any sea here? Can you see any coast? This is a shvila. This is that area that I showed you in the middle. It's not where they're supposed to be. The Bible says that they are living in tent city. I mean, this is 70 years now later after they've now come into israel and they're living in tent cities why 
Now I want you to hold that thought, okay? Can you, can you put on the next picture? This is, a, this is a picture of a place called Bet Shemesh. Okay, Bet Shemesh. And it's the, one of the valleys that leads up to Jerusalem. So if you want to attack, you will go up the valley, okay, this valley, okay, and, and you will attack the city. So what happened is, in these valleys that are basically going up into the mountains, they put what they call guard cities. Okay, one of the famous guard cities you will know as, as Megiddo or Armageddon. Okay, and Armageddon was a very, very important one because Armageddon is situated literally at the crossroad of the way of the kings and the way of the, of, of the sea. Okay, and they were right there. That's why they're saying whoever, whoever occupies Armageddon will be the one who is in charge of the end of the, uh, at the end of times because you can imagine how important it is okay so now in the story of samson and delilah remember the story of samson and delilah where does delilah come from do you, if you remember okay the zorach valley there is a zorach valley this is a zorach valley right here okay she comes from the zorach valley so if this is a zorach valley okay who lives there I mean, Lala was what? A Philistine. She wasn't Jewish. She was Philistine. Okay? On the side where the picture is taken from this side, okay, we're looking out into it, it is taken where the tribe of Dan was living. So remember the ridge that I showed you just now? And I said the whole tribe of Dan was? Now we're standing on that ridge, okay? So we are standing on a ridge and we're looking down, okay? And Lala and the Philistines are in that valley. Okay? So, I mean, they are pretty close to where Dan is. Okay? So, if this is a Zorach valley, Delilah was a Philistine. Okay? Where is Dan? Pretty close to them. Okay? Can you put in the next picture? Now, when you're looking at, at this, okay, again, now, the picture that I just showed you was on the other side. This is now completely opposite, and there's some ruins of one of the guard cities. And I, I want you to try and imagine, okay, that there were actually five. Oh, I wish this thing worked. Uh, that there were five cities, okay, and uh, all five of those cities were highly populated with the Philistines, okay. They were situated right here. Okay, and one of those cities was known as Akron, and the Bible says that the ark was in Beth Shemesh, the place where we looked just now, and God wasn't pleased with the way the Israelites were dealing with, with the way of they were telling the world about who God was. Okay, and what happened is the Philistines came up those valleys into Beth Shemesh. And literally, the Bible says that they burnt Beth Shemesh to the ground. And they took the city and they took the ark. Okay? Now, which city was it? It was Akron. So it was one of the cities to, to the right, by this way. Okay? Now, they are putting the ark in the open area because this is not closed. This is not taking the ark and hiding it away. They're putting the ark in the open area, okay? And almost like daring the Israelite, you want your ark back? Come and get it. Come and get it. And what does the tribe of Dan do about this whole thing? Because the tribe of Dan is up on that mountain over there, okay? What does the tribe of Dan do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're living on the ridge in tents because they're scared of God's portion. Okay? Because they're not supposed to be there. And they're sort of like looking at God and saying, we don't want what you gave us. It's not good enough, God. Why can't we have what the Judeans have? Or what Manasseh have? Or what Benjamin has? We, we don't like what you gave us. This is not fair, God. This is not enough, Lord. And God, I believe, puts you in a place for a reason. Hey? 
And you might not like it. And sometime the reason might just be for a season. But God puts you in this place. Now let's have a look at, at the first map. So I will need you to go to that first map. I think it's slide two. Now again, notice that Danny's position between Judah and Manasseh. Okay, so Danny's in the green. Manasseh is at the top there and Judah is at the bottom. Okay, and, and, and then Ephraim is on the side there. Can you see Ephraim there? There's Ephraim. He's right here. Manasseh is on top and then Judah is right here. Okay. In other words, they are protected there because where is Dan? Dan is in the middle of all of this. Yes, they are exposed to the sea, but they are protected. But it wasn't good enough, was it? Because they have this complex. They deserve more. So here is what they did. Let's look at Judges 18 verses 1 to 2. In those days, Israel had no king, and in those days the tribes of the Danites were seeking a place of their own where they might settle, because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Rubbish! They already had a place. They didn't like the place, but they already had a place. All the other tribes settled. So the Danites sent five of the leading men from Zorah, and Ashtalon, remember those two cities, okay, to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. And they told them, go, explore the land. Now, can I, can I ask you to show the second map? Not the first one? No? Carry on. So the map right at the, at the end of the, all the slides. Carry on. Again. Next one. Okay. Now where is Dan now? There they are. Okay. They moved from here to there. Way up there. They were supposed to be down there protected, but look where they are. In Judges 18, verses 7 to 10, don't worry about going there, I'll just read it. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety. Okay? Like the Sardians. At peace and secure. And since the land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidians and, and had no relationship with anyone else because they're all the way up there. Who wants to be all the way up there? No one even remembers that you are there. So when they returned to Zorah and Ashkelon, the fellow Danites asked them, How did you find things? The answer Come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate, they said, to go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands. A land that lacks nothing whatsoever. So you know the thing about the grass is greener on the other side? Okay? To them the grass is green on the other side and it is very green on that side. Okay? If you ever go with me to Israel, we actually go there because this is where Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? That's up there, that's in the mountains. And after a good winter, there's a lot of snow that melts from the mountains where, where, where modern-day Syria is. Okay? And what happens is the Golan Heights, you've heard about the Golan Heights, there, over there. And then the, the water melts and it goes in and the water is so nice and cold. And it's one of the tributaries. The Dan River is one of the tributaries that feeds into the Jordan River. Beautiful, luscious place. Okay? The grass was greener on the other side. So why did they want to go up north? So that they can lack nothing. So they can be self-supported. Now if we look at the map again, remember I told you about two places? Okay, the way of the kings and the way of the sea. Where did they meet? Right where Dan is. Okay? 
right where they knees. So what does that mean? That every army that came through to attack Israel would stage an attack where? Right here. Right where Dan is. So much so that the tribe of Dan, when the Babylonians came, was beaten so badly, there was no one to help them. No one to protect them because where is Ephraim and Manasseh? You can see it. There's Judah, there's Manasseh, there's Ephraim. They're right there. It will take them quite a long time to get up there. As a matter of fact, they were beaten so badly that the first tribe to disappear completely was the tribe of Dan. Was the tribe of Dan. So here's the deal. Okay? They were in the right place that God put them. But they said to themselves, No. Why have we got here? Why are you putting us here? There is nothing here. We want to go there. You see, they didn't trust God's story. They didn't trust the story of God. And as we look at that story, what are the implications that we can draw for ourselves? Well, how are we ensuring that your children don't forget all the amazing things that God has done? You need to trust in the story. And if God has put you in a place for a season, He's put you there for a reason. And we need to show that to our children. The second thing is, if you seek God only in desperate situation, God will keep you in desperate situation. Because you don't know how to trust Him outside of that. Isn't it? And God is not holding out on you. They were not content with the portion. God had amazing stuff that He wanted to do with them and, and instead actually God started using Asher, which is up on the top, and, and Ephraim, okay, and he started using them because he had stuff that he planned for Dan, but Dan was not content, and God wasn't holding out on them, and I believe we need to be happy, be content with the portion that God has given us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to go into time of uh, communion. So I'm going to ask the elders to come up. And in the meantime, if we can play the next song, please.